If we talk about what is the relationship between sports and faith, that seems to suggest that we've got an athletic thing. On the one hand, we call sports, and something that's non-athletic on the other side, whatever it is faith is, it's, it's not sports. And so we're trying to somehow think through these two uh, concepts together. And now we've inherited a world in which the philosoph- I'm, a, I'm a philosopher, okay? Philosophers aren't supposed to be into sports, right? So the philosophy, the life of the mind that philosophy represents and the athletic life of the body, those go in two different directions. And we think of Christianity, church is where we work on our souls. And again, the athletics is, is work on the body. And so we've split apart mind and body. We've split apart soul and body. And that is one of the, um, I'll call it dubious, dangerous legacies of modernity. Faith and sports have become specialized fields, fields that relate to distinct areas of life and reality. And I think one of the things I like least about contemporary sports is that it's so specialized. Um, and it's becoming increasingly specialized. When I was a kid, I played everything. Some of, some, of these, some of these guys play everything. But there's more and more kids who kind of play one sport, right, from the age of four on, and specialize way too early. And that's just stupid, right? It's, it's bad for your body. It's bad for your mind. It's bad for your life. Um, and it sort of has the, the pro sports model kind of filtering down to um, the much more interesting world of amateur sports. But that kind of specialization is another product of the world of modernity, right, which likes to specialize and carve up fields into territories and and bound them off as if they don't have anything to do with one another. Let's jump to some popular images and tensions, which I think reflect how we've got, we've inherited a, a kind of a mixed bag of modern categories, the dumb jock, right, is a classic one, and we've seen it on TV shows and in comics and and we probably perpetuated it ourselves, right? I mean, we think that athletes uh, might be, they've, they've figured out their bodies, they can do really amazing things, they're strong, but they're stupid, right? We don't want them in our classes if we're teachers um, and so on. They sit in the back and they just want to get... And that reflects an assumption, again, that the life of the body is one thing and the life of the mind is a very different thing. And I think the, the, the stereotype of the dumb jock, that's true. There's lots of dumb jocks. There's lots of brilliant ones, right? Um, but there's lots of ways in which the athletic life is through and through uh, a challenging intellectual uh, phenomenon. There's a lot of thinking that we do with our bodies, and let's not forget that minds are, after all, bodily organs. I can remember talking to you know, friends who, like of my parents and in-laws' generation, who were really talented athletes, who'd say, my parents just said, no, that's just not an avenue that you can go down, right? You could make the NHL, but you're going to work on the farm. Mennonites don't do sports in that sort of way. We do music. Sports and music, it's, too, it's the same thing, right? It's, um, it's, it's, it's all training, it's all practice, it's all performance, it's just different skills. Here's the, the kind of the money quote from Paul. People like this one because it's not just running, it throws in boxing, so there's kind of a couple of sports. So 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Most people stop there and they think it's something, it's, it's about winning, right? If you have good faith, you're more likely to win and be successful. This has nothing to do with what's going on here. Run in such a way that you may win it. Okay, it sounds like it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we do it to receive an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. We're all punishing our bodies. We're all training. We're all working at transforming ourselves, at conversion in some way. Throwing a baseball is not a normal, natural thing to do. It has to be learned. And Paul is saying, whatever it is that we, Christians, he wasn't actually a Christian, he was Jewish, but that's another story. Um, what we do and what we call the early church is we train and we're, we, we discipline, right? This is from Stanley Hauerwas, who was my uh, teacher at Duke. We also played softball on the same team. We were, uh, I was shortstop, he was second base, he was terrible. 
a torn rotator cuff in fairness. He couldn't throw the ball, um, but we had a lot of fun. This was a, a, an answer he gave to the question that went something like, how can we make sure our kids grow up to be moral or kind of keep our kids Christian? Put it this way, how do we keep our kids in the church, okay? Start with baseball and also teach them to read. Don't teach kids a bunch of rules. Help them to submit their lives to something that they find to be a wonderful activity that transforms them. Activities such as baseball and reading are where the virtues, we've already talked about those, are inculcated with a seriousness that is hard to match in other areas of our lives. Christians also ought to go to church. That's where you learn to practice religion and be virtuous. That's where you learn to practice the Christian virtues. It's unnatural at first, but that's what virtue is all about. It's hard to be truthful because truthfulness as a virtue requires transformation by being made humble, by letting ourselves be transformed by what is strange to us. And the point here is, you know, kind of the subtext here is that sadly the church isn't nearly as serious as uh, these other areas of life when it comes to the business of training, when it comes to the business of discipleship. And I think one of the challenges that the contemporary church faces is it's just not interesting, right? It's not hard enough. It's not challenging enough. It's not demanding enough. Uh, we're scared of people leaving. We want to keep the numbers up and keep the offering plates full, and so we don't want to say anything that might be hard. Right? But then it's not athletic anymore. David Epstein, is a, he, I think he's a Sports Illustrated writer, um, and his book, The Sports Gene, I don't know if anyone's read it, uh, it's won all kinds of prizes, and it's a book that basically his argument is some things we thought were genetic aren't, and some things that we thought weren't are. Um, I want to talk about one of the things that we used to think was genetic and isn't, and um, that has to do with the question of, of kind of great athletic performance and how athletes see the old view, the old theory used to be that great athletes were just genetic flukes that were capable of picking things up faster, okay? So we all know, you know, somebody like Wayne Gretzky, one of the great things that he had, he wasn't a physical specimen so much as he could just see he was like one step ahead, okay? And we used to think that he was just his eyes, right? His neurons just fired faster and he could see faster than you or I could see. Um, but as it turns out, when it comes to simple reaction time, responding to a stimulus, all of us are pretty much as good as Wayne Gretzky. We line them up and like, throw a thing of water at someone. We all have pretty much it's 200 milliseconds, so one-fifth of a second, um, to, to kind of pick up and respond to that. And, and the person that helped uh, kind of popularize this is a woman by the name of Janet Starks. She used to teach here. Um, I think she was a basketball player by profession, but her studies were all on volleyball. And she developed what she called the occlusion test, to kind of test for this thing. Is it, is it raw reaction, kind of a genetic thing, or is it something that's learned? And the occlusion test uh, is set up this way. She took a bunch of volleyball slides. Uh, I think this is in about the 80s, so it's 30-some years old by now. And she digitally removed the volleyball from some of those slides. And so she gave these slides to a range of people. Some of them were elite volleyball players. Some of them were, say, club players. Some of them were you know, beginning volleyball players. And some of them were people like me who suck at volleyball. And uh, people like me couldn't tell the difference. Right? We, couldn't, we couldn't tell her whether the volleyball was present in this slide or that slide. Um, the average athletes did slightly better. The elite athletes were saying, yeah, it's not in that slide. Uh, it's in this one, and that's, that's where it went out, right? Um, and in a blink of an eye, they were able to tell exactly what was going on because through a life of repetition and learning, you develop the capacity to see things with a kind of a, a fine, finer grain of detail and nuance, okay? The Christian life uh, is about cultivating ways of seeing that allow us to see the world uh, and, and, in a sense, live in a world that's different than the world that other people live in, a world that maybe doesn't distinguish between friend and enemy, okay, in the same way, um, a world that welcomes a stranger. We can go on and on and on and list the examples, but it has everything to do with this sort of thing. And, of course, this is learned, right? We're not born Christians. We're made. This is what the language of born again <laughs> means, right? Christians don't fall out uh, of their mothers. They're created. And how do you create them? By discipline, by training, uh, and by cultivating virtues. Medium athletes like me, we want to skip the stuff that's hard. 
we know that we're pretty good at this and not so good at that, so we focus on this, uh, and we skip the hard work. Uh, we don't like failure, and so we avoid it, right? Great athletes are the ones who kind of work at their weaknesses, right? If they see something that they fail, they work to perfect it. Think again of the Christian life, right? Christian life is kind of a, it's kind of into failure. We call it sin. Um, and, and deep practice is that practice that kind of focuses on weaknesses, focuses on failures, and works at them. So I like to think that, that, that church is a place uh, in which deep practices are cultivated, okay? Uh, the only question is which ones. So this is what I mean by thinking of Christianity as athletic, okay? Christianity is athletic because it's, it's basically all about training. It's all about making. It's all about transforming and conversion. These are all ways of seeing the same thing. 